So today I'm going to be talking about, uh, spend a few minutes talking about structure hardening and defensible space. These are just actions you can take to help your home um, survive during a wildland fire. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today I, I learned when I was working for IBHS, um, which is that fancy lab in South Carolina. I'll show you a, a, a video from it in a minute. Um, so here we go. Uh, your home has to be able to to survive the basic uh, exposures that it will be subjected to uh, given it's threatened by a, by a wildfire. And these exposures you're seeing here, there are the windblown embers, far upper left-hand picture in this slide. Um, embers have been shown to be the most important uh, factor in, in home ignitions. Um, they are responsible for between 60 and 90% of, of ignitions of buildings during wildfires. I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, embers in a minute. Uh, the other two are flame contact, the upper right hand picture where flames actually are able to touch the home, typically by fire burning to the building and radiant heat, the bottom middle picture uh, that could be uh, a wood pile at some distance from the home or a neighbor's home, um, things like that, that where flames don't actually touch, but heat radiated, radiated through the air, um, impinges on the home, break glass in a window, can ignite a combustible siding, depending on the, on the duration and the amount of exposure. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, so these are three basic things um, that a home has to, to um, resist. Here's a couple of pictures just demonstrating visually why embers are so important. We have two, two pictures um, here, uh, both of them from the Angora fire, 2007 in the South Lake Tahoe. I think the right-hand picture is the most, uh, most, most uh, demonstrates the importance of embers. We see this with the green vegetation around the home and the burning building, the burning home. So clearly the fire didn't burn to the building, to the home. Um, it was the embers from the wildfire or from other burning, uh, structure during the wildland fire that landed on, near, or in the home, ignited it, and uh, burned it to the ground uh, without damaging surrounding vegetation uh, of the home. So um, embers are really important because of what they can do, what I call directly, and what, I, what they can do uh, indirectly. Uh, direct ember ignition, as we see in the fence in the bottom middle picture, embers landed on the fence, ignited it without any help from any other thing, such as vegetative debris and the like. The upper left-hand picture is, is uh, from the lab in South Carolina where we could uh, generate these ember exposures to a full-size building. Um, and we could sub subject that building to wind speeds of up to 130 miles an hour is the capability of the lab for our wildfire experiments. Uh, we uh, the maximum wind speed we used was sort of upwards of 60. But you see the ember landing on near the home uh, was this kind of setup that we used to evaluate the, um, the ignition potential of fencing that we see in the bottom picture. And that's the example of direct ember ignition. The upper right-hand picture shows um, indirect ember ignition. And, and indirect ember ignitions result in flame contact and or radiant heat to the building. So the examples we're seeing in this picture are ignition of debris in a gutter that results in a flaming exposure to the edge of the roof and uh, ignition of mulch at the base of the wall that in this case also results in flaming exposure in this case to the siding and uh, to the window ultimately. In this picture we're seeing uh, a vinyl gutter on the left and a metal gutter on the right. You'll notice that the vinyl gutter is detaching and falling to the ground. This is very typical for ignition of debris in a, in a, metal, in a vinyl or plastic gutter. And uh, the debris staying put in the metal gutter, um, continually being an edge of roof by flame impingement exposure um, scenario. So these scenarios are really typical. Uh, vinyl gutters, plastic gutters, are gutters typically fall to the ground when debris in them ignites, metal gutters stay put. But the important thing here is that uh, indirect ember ignition results in flaming and or radiant heat. And that's, I think, the, this indirect ignition scenario is one reason why 
embers are so important to um, ignition scenarios and and being and creating ember ignition resistance to a home is is important in, in its survival i'm going to show a fairly quick video um, that i'm uh, sort of taking the sound away but this is a demonstration we did back in 2011 but it's it shows a, a wide variety of things so here we're loading the ember generator and then uh, before the demonstration we were putting uh, some bark mulch and vegetation around the base of the wall that we're seeing here and then we'll see the ember generators working and um you know um uh, the uh, uh, wind is coming from the fans behind those ember generators. We see em embers landing on the roof. You can see it um, landing and impinging on the screen window screen. This is one reason why window screening is, is so important. Uh, in this case, the window is open. So, um, you know, having that screen there helps minimize ember entry into the building. You just saw the vinyl gutter detach and fall. You see the uh, ignited debris and the metal gutter on the right staying put. We have ignition of, of debris on the roof in the valley, um, ignition of bark mulch um, at the base of the wall, and this interior corner here, it's called a re-entrant corner. Um, it'll get to be a pretty big fire in a minute. This is sort of a replay of the, of the detached plastic gutter, and here's a pretty big fire in the interior corner that um, this is a visual of, of why um, mi minimizing uh, um, uh, veg uh, combustible things in, in an interior corner is so important because that is a pretty vulnerable spot on your home. Um, let's see, you can see now flames entering into the in what would be the occupied space. Uh, once flames touch this uh, plastic clad vinyl uh, um, uh, window screen, and it, it it fails and so it did a good job of keeping embers out until until flames touched that screen and, and then it was um, done so we saw a number of things and you can see here um, i think the why embers are so important to uh, um, uh, building home survival and i i use the word structure here because um, it, it applies to any kind of a building, whether it be one you're living in or one that your farm animals are living in, one you store stuff in, you know, so ranch, ag, home, you know, the, the, the vulnerability of buildings or structures are similar. These uh, buildings survive when two things are done um, to the area around the home. And the first is related to the location and selection of vegetation and other combustible materials on the property and then things you do to the home itself. So here we see as an example, here's a, a home um, with a lot of vegetation around it. Um, you can imagine that uh, given certain ember ignition scenarios that this vegetation, the fire could burn directly to the, to the home. But even if all that um, greenery that you see in this picture were, were missing, um, embers can fly upwards of a mile and so and be clearly threatening to a home uh, from a distance of, of, a, of a quarter to half a mile because in terms of getting enough embers to the home. So even if you, you have done a perfect job in, in uh, vegetation clearing near your home, um, it will still be threatened by wildland fires. So, homes and buildings must be able to also resist uh, these ember things, embers, because of the distance at which they can fly and still uh, create a vulnerable situation for a building. So this is sort of a sort of a summary slide indicating um, things we do to protect structures or our uh, vegetation management on the property and this vegetation management includes vegetation but it also includes other combustible things like wood piles tool sheds and the like that can be around the primary building of interest and then things you do to the structure itself in terms of and we usually talk about these things in terms of the components of the building or the structure so the roof the vents the exterior wall that includes any openings such as windows and and uh, area under eat area and uh, and then attachments. This can be decks or fencing, things that are attached to the building. 
the left hand part of this picture really just shows kind of a checklist if you're thinking about protecting your you know, a structure that you um, want to protect you know you, you think about things around it that's sort of the property things and then things about it and that's in this uh, slide it's the home but it really just means the structure the building itself so detrimental space um, really in order to think about that we think about it in terms of zones around the primary building of interest we think of this of the area right next to the to the building this would be nominally zero to five feet and then five to let's say 30 feet and then 30 feet to 100 or so and many um, people that live in neighborhoods they don't really control they, you know their property doesn't extend 100 feet from their home so for 5 to 30 and 30 to 100 we always say 5 to the proper 30 feet or the property line or 30 feet to 100 feet or the property line and if your neighbor is within 20 feet of you for example um, this points to the need to have a neighborhood approach or a community approach because you can do you can uh, threaten your neighbor's house should your home ignite and vice versa so the difficult space careful selection location and maintenance of vegetation and other combustible materials on your properties other other combustible materials tool shed as i indicate tool shed uh, wood pile things like that this near building zone is really important it's called a number of things i don't want you to get hung up on on a new name for it it's called a zero to five foot zone it's called the near building zone it's called the non-combustible zone it's called the immediate zone there's a number of names that that um, organizations have put on this zone just know that near your home or near the building of interest you need to have minimize combustible materials because embers can land there and you don't want those embers to be able to ignite uh, things there because then uh, they can uh, result that will result in either a flaming exposure and or radiant heat exposure that can damage your home so this near building zone includes the un includes the footprint under any attached deck so we see this middle picture showing gravel there this, these are this good good uh, implementation of this non-combustible zone you really can't the far right hand picture it's you know a stored wood pile you really can't expect this deck to um, survive should uh, that those boards ignite and before embers penetrate into the stack of uh, boards debris would have, would have done it before so you'll have a lot of fine fuels within that wood pile which will make that wood pile much more easily ignited by embers and you have the flaming exposure once the deck ignites it's a pathway to uh, ignition of of the primary building of interest so typically your home but it can be anything that the deck is attached to okay um, so, and part and parcel with this horizontal non-combustible zone is a vertical non-combustible zone. If you don't have, um, if the, particularly if you have combustible cladding or siding, if it goes all, all the way to the ground, then embers will accumulate in, at that location, ignite the siding and uh, enter the house or the building that way. So you need to have some distance between the ground and the start of a combustible cladding or siding Typically, uh, six inches is, is a good number um, in order to protect that area from uh, the ember accumulation in that zone and, and the, what could be a resultant ignition just, just from an, a direct ember ignition of that cladding right on the ground with the siding right on the ground. So the left-hand picture is a demonstration again at the, at the uh, IBHS uh, Research Center in Richburg, South Carolina indicating that uh, clad, siding that goes all the, way, all the way to the ground easily ignited by embers um, if you have a non-combustible area between the ground and the start of the siding sorry i didn't remember that um, you can protect that siding from from an ember, a direct ember ignition this other zone we really uh, want to focus it's not like you can't have vegetation at all we want to focus on having a discontinuity or islands of vegetation so that if any one of those islands ignites that it can't easily spread to another island of vegetation and can't e easily threaten your home or the building by 
contacting it directly from the flames of the, of the burning vegetation or uh, having enough energy that it can break glass in a window, for example. So islands of vegetation is really much better. And uh, the silver gray uh, color is really this non-combustible zone under next to, near the home or near the building and under the footprint of an attached deck. That's sort of the, the uh, bottom line with regard to um, uh, this, this zone away from the home or building. So these are some pictures that Rebecca shared with me and I, we can just sort of talk about them. Um, the picture on the left, there's uh, some combustible straw or hay uh, right next to the, to the barn. This would be easily ignited by embers and there's, you notice there's some wood piled up against uh, the front of this barn. Um, so the, these, uh, in this particular picture, you'd have a number of things that are vulnerable from an ember um, exposure perspective. The barn door in this case is open. You know, that should be closed when wildfire is threatening because embers will blow into this area and ignite um, other combustible things that might be in, inside the barn. So closing the barn door, um, closing windows when wildfire is threatening is a good way to help keep embers out of the inside of the structure. And this uh, uh, structure here, there are some combustible things inside of it, but here you can imagine um, fire being able to burn directly into and under this area, igniting the things that are stored there. Um, in this case, you know, you would want to create this zone around the, around the building so that fire can't burn directly to it. And, and then similarly, um, uh, embers igniting in that area couldn't ignite that uh, same uh, grass covering. Um, you could use fire retardant tarps to cover some of these combustible materials uh, when, when wildfire is threatening. Um, um, I think it would really depend on what this material is, how easy it would be to ignite. But um, the stuff underneath the material inside or underneath the, the, uh, this, this structure and then the, the um, grass around it both make it vulnerable to, to wildland fire. Um, so you need to sort of consider these things when you're trying to protect um, um, uh, farm and ag kind of property. If you live in a neighborhood, um, then you need to worry about uh, the, how easily ignited your, your neighbor can be. This is a picture from Tubbs Fire Coffee Park. You'll notice that all those red dots are, are structures that are homes that were lost. Inevitably, when you have a lot of uh, high density neighbor, when you have a high density neighbor, hood and, and, and wildfire enters the neighborhood, then you have a lot of home to home in this case or structure to structure ignitions. Um, it's a neighborhood or a community effort because of the impact that your burning home can have on your neighbor. Uh, this is uh, Eastern Tennessee fire, but it really shows the importance of radiant heat. Here we have uh, the two homes are, are uh, the same in, in the two pictures. Here we have the, in the left-hand picture, we have a burning cabin um, with a radiant heat exposure to the, to the cabin on the left. You'll notice there's a little bit of flame coming out from the ridge of the roof, peak, peak of the roof. Uh, there is a window in the, in the upper part here that broke, and, and I'm thinking, uh, as a result of this radiant heat, fire got into the, into the home. On the right-hand picture, this is 10 or 15 minutes later. So um, a um, very combustible, fast growth fire, um, but the ignition was via a radiant heat scenario. So when you have a close by neighbor um, and close by is uh, 20, 30 feet, um, in this particular um, um, scenario, I measured distance between uh, damage and, and, uh, and uh, lost buildings or homes and the average where homes were lost was a 30 was 35 feet uh, some some work um, we're doing for a campfire indicates that that number is slightly higher so if you're within 40 to 50 feet of your neighbor then that neighbor can threaten your home okay so we're going to start just spending a few minutes on on the structure part we talked a little bit about defensible space we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the structure part starting with the roof um, and 
I think the, the main thing I want to point out is that you have heard, I think, you, that the best thing you can do for your, for your roof is to, is to make sure that it has a class A fire rating. And I just wanted to point out that the fire rating talks about the performance of the roof in the red circle area. But your roof can also be vulnerable uh, where it meets other things. So the yellow square parts where roof meets wall, where roof meets vent, where roof meets gutter, where roof meets skyline. These are also vulnerable locations. And the fire rating of the roof doesn't tell you about how it's going to perform there. So just as an example, here's where roof meets wall. You know, here we have a lot of uh, vegetative debris, pine needles on the roof next to this uh, wall that has a shingle siding in this split level house. On the right hand picture, it's from the IBHS Research Center uh, facility where we demonstrated the ease with which embers can ignite this fine fuel, pine needles and the like that can accumulate on the roof next to, um, next to the siding. So wherever um, uh, debris will accumulate, so will embers. And so this will be easily ignited uh, during a wildland fire. And I would argue that the vulnerable part of this roof isn't the Class A roof covering, it's the siding next to the Class A roof covering. So in these cases, you know, keeping debris off your roof is really important. Um, you can replace siding locally, put a non-combustible siding product here. You don't, you don't need to worry about everywhere on the building necessarily, um, particularly if, if your neighbor's far away. You can put some metal flashing um, that is roughly six inches tall between the roof and the siding. You need to make sure that that flashing tucks behind the, the siding in this case, or else if water gets behind the flashing, between the flashing and the siding, you're gonna have a rot problem, a decay problem. So you don't want, want that either. So it's just that the flashing thing can help with the fire part, but you need to make sure it doesn't uh, have a problem with the water part of of uh, you know this situation. Uh, this is uh, a little bit of, about an exterior wall. Um, here, you know, I think it's really an important picture because it shows the, the the ease with which fire can spread up and and around on a wall. Um, and this is all because of ignition, ember ignition of, of pine uh, of uh, bark mulch or mulch next to the siding. So ign embers ignited mulch. It's easy for that to happen. M burning mulch ignited siding. Siding burnt up the wall and laterally across the wall, impinging on the window here, impinging in the under eave area at on this gable end of the of the of the home, and then impinged on the on the gable end vent. So the fire entered the building, entered the, the attic space in the upper eave area and the upper and the under eave area of this uh, roof, and it entered the attic through the vent. In many cases, we did this experiment a few times and it broke the glass a number of the times. And it did all of these enter the home issues before the siding, the fire could burn through the siding into the home that way. So you have to make sure that all things on the wall provide compar comparable or comparable performance. Window, vent, and under eave area are all more vulnerable than the siding itself. But because the siding is combustible and, and flame spread rapidly up and over, you know, you, you were impinging on these other components of the wall. Um, so that's the, the message about the, uh, the, the exterior wall. It can be vulnerable if fire burns through it, but it can also be vulnerable if flame spreads up it because of what it does to the other components that are on the wall. I think a lot of people think that that a non-combustible siding is the is the answer to uh, to um, a survivable home or building. Um, there are many pictures I can show you of non-combustible siding and a, and a destroyed home. So here we have a, a home in the Cedar Fire, 2003, San Diego County. Um, it was another. Uh, with a non-combustible wall, another vulnerability of the building that resulted in its loss. The right-hand picture is a Kmart store in Santa Rosa during the Tubbs fire. Again, a very non-combustible cladding. The inside of this of, this, of the store is, is, is gutted. Um, so it made a, a really good radiant heat barrier for the other parts of this mall, strip mall, but it did not help or protect uh, the store itself. So siding is important, particularly 
if uh, your neighbor is close, but it doesn't guarantee um, a survivable home if you have other vulnerabilities and some of the ones that we've been talking about. Um, there's a lot of, there's some questions I think about whether paint or a, a coating um, can provide protection. And, and the, the answer right now, and this is some pictures from a research project we did while I was at IBHS. And the answer right now is that coatings uh, currently cannot provide long-term protection. And so you should not rely on a coating to protect your combustible siding material or deck material because it doesn't uh, uh, last long enough. It, it, the the, the um, effectiveness of, of, of these fire retardant coatings in this study we did was less than a year. And um, you know, I think you don't want to be putting uh, paint on every year to protect your, your home. So for now, there are other, other measures you can do, such as this non-combustible zone that can uh, much more effective protection of, of your home or building. Uh, decks, decks are going to be vulnerable from embers from above or flames from below. You want to minimize the chance for flames from below with creating and maintaining an effective defensible space by, um, and by creating this non-combustible zone under the deck itself. The uh, windblown ember part, you need to do things to uh, make the deck less resistant to ember ignition or protect your deck given that it might ignite from an ember exposure. So this picture, for, again, the left-hand picture from, well, both of these pictures are from a project that we conducted uh, while I was at IBHS. I want you to look at the left-hand picture and you can see there's two places where embers accumulate. One is right where the, where the ground meets the siding. So you can see this bright spot where embers are accumulating and then a, few, and then a distance a few feet away. So embers are gonna flow during a wildfire when wind driven embers are going to blow against the building and then recirculate back back and they're going to stop at a recirculation at a stagnation point and they're going to accumulate on the right hand picture in the between deck board gap on top of a joist so this is where ignition is going to occur um, so you want to keep debris out of that um, uh, space the gap you, if you if you're remodeling a deck, you want to make the gap as big as possible. That helps with uh, it helps with um, uh, the fire self extinguishing once it starts. And the other um, area here is where uh, this deck to wall. We if, if you want to clean that area and make sure that debris is is kept away. You can put this metal flashing um, at the deck to wall to provide a, a non-combustible uh, surface there uh, vertically. And you can, you know, replacing a deck can be expensive, but if you replace the deck board right next to the home or building and replace it with a non-combustible deck board or a metal grate, um, that can help protect the building because even though the fire might ignite and burn towards the building, it'll, it'll have its own non-combustible zone between the deck and, and the building or home. There's a lot of interest, I think, in, in closing the deck. Horizontal enclosure when you have a deck with deck boards is not a good idea because you'll have a moisture problem. So here, you know, uh, corrosion of uh, metal fasteners, decay or degradation of joists and deck boards. Um, if you're going to, if you have a deck low to the ground, you can consider a, a vertical enclosure, but it should be with um, with a one eighth inch mesh screen so that you can air can still get get in and out, and moisture can do the same thing. We're going to finish up just on a fence. You know, you shouldn't have combustible fencing attaching to your home. So here, if you have a, a, a wooden fence, replace that section with a metal component, metal gate. Uh, chain link fence kind of a thing you, you don't so that you minimize a chance for the fire to burn directly to the home carry fire to the home so um, that's all for me um, I'm sure there'll be time for questions but I'm going to stop sharing I, I gave you some uh, two websites um, on the bottom one is uh, a University of California website and the other one is an IBHS website both have good information on wildfire preparedness for for structures and my email address if you have questions. Um, so 
going to stop sharing and turn it back to uh, Rebecca.